This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of drugs, violence, or criminal activity in any way. A TikTok video of some teenagers in Milwaukee hot wiring and stealing Kias has created a frenzy of car thefts throughout the nation. And while advancements in security features have reduced car thefts over the past three decades, some kids have exposed a huge security vulnerability vulnerability with two Korean cars, Kias and Hondas, where thieves can steal them not with sophisticated equipment, but with a simple USB cord. So how are they doing it? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching A Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we're going to look at the Kia Boys, the rash of car thefts around the nation, and just how they are doing it. In doing so, we will review the history of car ignition security, the key. From the metal key to the chip key to the keyless fobs we use today, we're going to look at how that evolution has changed the way thieves steal cars. We will talk about one of my former cases. It's a racketeering case where my client was part of a group that stole over 50 cars in somewhat of an ingenious fashion, which worked until it didn't and they got busted. But I'll tell you how they did it and the slip up that ultimately landed them behind bars. Finally, I will show you how the Kia boys do it, step by step. Not so that you can steal cars, I'm telling you about it so that if you are an owner of a Kia or a Hyundai, you can take action to protect your ride. If you enjoy the episode, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, you got a comment, put it in the comment sections below. And if you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Smash that subscribe button. In today's video, we are talking about hot wiring cars that is bypassing the traditional ignition security systems. We are not talking about just stealing cars in general, like gaining the true owner's key by force or theft or deception and then using it to drive the car away, because there are innumerable ways to do that. In fact, most cars are not stolen by carjacking, but when the owners simply leave the keys in them, often running. In this video, we are talking about thieves who hotwire or start a car and drive it away without ever gaining control of the owner's key because these are the sneaky bastards that you need to watch out for. So the first thing we need to understand is how a car's ignition system works because when it comes to hot wiring, that's the name of the game, getting the vehicle started. The ignition system of a car consists of several components working together to get your vehicle running. In the simplest of terms, it is just an electrical circuit flowing from the car's battery through other components and then back to the negative battery terminal. When the car is off, there is a break in that circuit or it is open at the ignition switch. So to close the circuit and get the electricity flowing, you turn the ignition switch on. This used to be done by inserting a simple metal key into a locking mechanism that releases, allowing the ignition switch behind the lock to be turned. Here is a look at an old school ignition lock as well as a traditional ignition switch. The first turn of the key usually powers the dash. Turn it again and another electrical switch is closed, connecting the three components needed to start the car. The battery, the ignition system, and the engine starter components. So hot wiring connects these three things without the use of a key. And that key was originally simply a piece of metal. 
Starting in about 1990, most new vehicles had keys that also had a built-in chip that communicated with the vehicle's ignition system. And today, most vehicles don't use a key at all to turn on the ignition switch. Instead, a fob or a keyless remote control communicates with the car's computer to let it know that you are the correct person to start the vehicle. Interestingly, the way people hotwire cars has changed as the key has changed. So we are going to go back and look at that evolution because what you will ultimately learn is that the Kia boys are using what was thought to be an outdated old school method to steal cars. So prior to 1950, cars were generally started with a crank, a push of a button, or the flip of a switch. The problem was anyone could start your car. So auto manufacturers decided that they were going to put a lock on the ignition switch. And in 1949, Chrysler introduced the first metal key that would only allow the ignition switch to be turned in conjunction with the unlocking of a tumbler or a lock cylinder. In 1965, Ford came out with its double-sided key, which then became the standard in the industry. And between then and 1990, it was used in almost all of the cars manufactured in the world. And while car thefts took a dip for a couple of decades, they would start rising again and continue to do so as time marched on. Then in 1986, the first chip or transponder key was used with the Corvette. It was specifically designed to reduce Corvette thefts, but by the 1990s, it was being used across the industry because it worked really, really well. And by 2000, car thefts would drop to a quarter of what they were in the 80s. Then in 2003, Mercedes-Benz introduced the first fully functional keyless entry and starter fob, which of course now dominates the automobile industry. And looking forward, BMW and Tesla are pushing the envelope of smartphone entry and ignition. So stay tuned as the industry continues to evolve. Regardless of the key, to hotwire a car, you want to bypass the ignition locking system, whatever it is, on the starter. So let's start with the old school basic metal ignition keys used between 1950 and 1990. Now the ignition lock tumbler has evolved over time, but its fundamental purpose has always remained the same, to require a specific key to reach the car's actual ignition switch. So a thief's goal is to break, bypass, or remove this lock tumbler to gain access to that switch. Thieves generally do this in one of the following ways. Method one is to break the lock cylinder, and there's lots of ways to do that. One of them is the screwdriver method. After hitting the lock with a dose of WD-40, thieves will place a flathead screwdriver or a chisel where the key should be inserted into the ignition switch. They then hit it with a hammer, breaking the locking pins in the tumbler. Then they will turn the screwdriver, usually with a vice grip, hoping to turn the ignition switch starting the car. The pros are that it's super fast, the cons are that it requires a great deal of strength and doesn't work most of the time. Usually you just wind up tearing up the ignition switch. More sophisticated criminals will drill the lock, which is exactly how it sounds. You hit it with a small drill bit about a third of the way up from the bottom and again about a third of the way down from the top. Or Thieves will just use a large drill bit and just completely destroy the middle of the lock. Either way, the goal is to disintegrate the tumbler pins in the lock. Then you can place your screwdriver in the cylinder and turn the ignition switch. Staying in the genre of brute force, but technically a different method uses a slide hammer to remove the lock. So a slide hammer is an interesting tool. It's a pole with a stopper on each end and a weighted handle that slides in both directions. So depending upon which way you slide that weighted handle, you get a hammering force either toward an object or away from it. They are used a lot in dent removal, especially in areas where you can't get to the back side of the metal to bang on it. So what car thieves do is they put a screw in the attachment end. They screw the slide hammer into the keyhole, and then they slide the hammer back to pop the ignition tumbler right out of the hole. 
and it can be done in seconds. Other thieves will use the lock pick method. Now there are literally hundreds of videos on how to pick a lock, so I'm not gonna get into great detail in this video, but essentially you have a tension rod at the bottom of the lock, a pick tool at the top, and you manipulate the pins. You can use a paper clip or a bobby pin bent on the end, a formal lock pick tool or a lock rake, which you rake back and forth, manipulating the pin until the lock opens. And voila, you can turn the ignition. Now, not all ignition switches are accessible or can be physically manipulated in these ways. Sometimes thieves have to move away from the starter switch and instead use the wires of the car to start it. And this is what most people think of when they hear the word hot wire. To do this, you have to remove the panel or the cover on the steering column. There is usually an upper and lower section that normally can just be torn off, although sometimes you might have to undo a screw or two. From there, in the movies, there are two wires that you spark together and the car starts. In reality, it ain't that easy because there are a bunch of wires under there that operate everything attached to the steering column. Lights, blinkers, wiper, wiper fluid, cruise control, side mirrors, etc. It's overwhelming. But the cords are usually sectioned into three main bundles of wires. A thief is looking for the set that runs up to the steering column directly to the ignition switch. Usually there is a plastic connector there that you can detach or thieves will just cut the wires off with wire cutters or a knife. Within that specific bundle, there are usually five wires, but you only use three of them. The primary power supply from the battery, the ignition wire, and the starter wire. The colors will vary depending upon the manufacturer, but the battery wire is usually red, the ignition wire is often blue or brown, and the starter wire often yellow. So thieves will strip the ends of those three wires. They then splice the battery wire with the ignition wire. This will power the dash. The next step is to spark the starter wire against the wires that you just spliced. You aren't going to attach the starter wire, you just touch it to the others long enough for the car to start. It's somewhat dangerous and a good way to electrocute yourself, but it used to work and the car would operate as normal until the wires were separated, after which time the car would die. In putting this video together, I actually bounced that description off a former criminal client of mine that I knew had hotwired and stolen cars. And this is what he said, and I quote, Man, it's dark. You can't see the color of the wires. And I wouldn't know what wire goes with what anyway. You just touch each wire to another wire until the dash lights up, tie those two together, and then spark it against the others until it starts. End quote. So apparently the process of elimination works as well. The last old school way to hotwire a car is under the hood with the solenoid method. And this requires thieves to know a little something about engines. There are a few different ways to do this depending upon the ignition configuration, but in its simplest form, you just put a piece of metal between the positive and negative posts of the solenoid and the car turns over. Now, sometimes you have to run a jumper cable from the positive side of the battery terminal to the solenoid to power the dashboard but then you just use a screwdriver or other piece of metal to short the solenoid's positive post to the negative post, activating the starter mower and cranking the car. Now I call this the mechanics method because you have to know what a solenoid is and more importantly, where it is on the car that you are hot wiring and most thieves don't. So they are left with one of the other methods. From there, in most models, there is also a locking mechanism with the steering wheel to prevent theft. If you have ever been sitting in your vehicle and turned it off and then turned the wheel a little bit and had it lock on you, you know what I mean. And it is supposed to stay locked until the proper key is inserted. But 
the reality of it is that the lock on the steering wheels are pretty weak and can be broken by simply sharply torquing the wheel. So it's easy to bypass for people who are hot wiring cars. So those are the traditional old school methods of how thieves used to hot wire cars manufactured before the 90s with a simple metal key. Then auto manufacturers came out with the chip key or the transponder key. And these new keys changed everything because regardless of which old school method a thief was using, unless the car's ignition system also recognized the chip, it ain't starting. And here's how the immobilizer system, as it is called, works. When you place the key in the ignition, it activates a small antenna that emits a tiny low power signal that looks for the correct resonance from the key's chip. It is a passive system, but it works very well. And if it doesn't receive the proper return signal, the car does not start. Now, it's possible to duplicate these chip keys, but you're going to need a working key to do it, specialized equipment, and a way to get the key code from the manufacturer, because after about 2010, they only gave them to dealers. The transponder key works in basically the same way. It sends a radio frequency to the transceiver in the car, and if and only if it matches, will the ignition ECU, that's the engine control unit, allow it to be started. It's a little different technology than the chip key, but it's the same concept. As fewer and fewer pre-1990s cars were on the road, overall car thefts from hot wiring plummeted worldwide because now, even if you can bypass the ignition lock, you still need the correct frequency or resistance to make the car go. So really only very sophisticated criminals that had access to a chip key and an advanced scanner like an Altel Maxisys, which can reprogram a chip key and a car, these were the only people who were able to hotwire vehicles. And even then it takes 10 to 15 minutes to program a key and you still need one cut to the correct specifications to make it work. So it became very difficult to hotwire cars, and these chipped keys reduced car thefts to one-fourth of what they were in the 90s. It was a huge success. Now, interestingly, during this time period, when it was much harder to steal cars, a client of mine stole over 50, and it's still the only racketeering case that I've ever been involved with involving Grand Theft Auto. So here is what went down. My client worked at a low-end used car lot on the north end of town, a buy here, pay here type of place. They would sell a car and then in three or four months, they would go and steal it. From there, they took it to a chop shop that would cut it up and they would sell the metal for scrap. It was pretty low budget, but it worked. So how did they do it? Well, it wasn't hot wiring at all. They used a second key. And if the vehicle came onto the lot with two, it was easy. Sell the car with one key and keep the second key, then use it later to go and steal the car. They also had the buyer's credit application, which listed their home and their work address, and often indicated whether the car would be garaged or not because lenders are interested in the protection of their collateral. And these guys stole a bunch of cars this way. And had they stayed with stealing cars that already had two keys, they might have gotten away with it longer. But they got greedy. They started having a second key made for cars that only had one. So my client would take the car and the car lot's title to a dealership and have a second key made. He would then have the dealership program it to the car. And that part was perfectly legal. It was after he sold the car and then he took the new key to steal the car back. Well, that obviously was not. And after a rash of these cars were stolen from only a couple of car lots, the feds started putting two and two together. And it took several months, but ultimately it was that paper trail at the dealership that sealed my client's coffin in that case. Regardless, the reality of the situation was that stealing a car with a chipped key takes some planning. It's not a smash and grab job. And so car thefts went way, way down. 
Then the car industry got cute again and went to keyless entry, ignition, and remote starting. You can warm up your car in the wintertime while you stay inside, and it's nice. And because you can do this by remote control, metal keys were not needed anymore. The difference in these fobs and the chipped key is that while the chip only emits a signal when it is inserted into the ignition, fobs continuously emit a radio frequency over a large distance. That's how your car's fancy computer knows to light up and unlock the doors when you are walking up to it. And that's great, except that your key fob is continually emitting a radio frequency. So your car is always a heartbeat away from being activated and starting. And because of that, it's actually easier to steal a car now than back in the chip days. And here's how. It's the relay box. So here's the scenario. You park your car in the parking garage, walk inside your apartment, lock your apartment because you are safe, right? And you hang your keys on the wall by the door because you're responsible and you won't lose them that way. Here's the problem. A thief just watched you park and walk into your apartment. And about midnight, he is going to be standing outside your front door with an electronic device called a relay box. And that relay box is going to pick up the frequency being emitted by your key, and it is going to be relayed to another box that his buddy is holding right next to your car. Box two records and emits the signal. Your car thinks it's the actual fob, and the car is stolen with the push of the ignition button. This works with most fobs and is how people steal a lot more high-end cars these days. Now there's an easy fix to this problem. Get a metal jewelry or other box with a lid. The metal will actually contain and block the fob's radio frequency, foiling would-be car thieves. But most people simply don't bother. So that brings us to 2022. And right now, car thefts are way, way up. And based upon the fact we are in 2022, it would seem logical that the recent spike in car thefts would be attributable to the relay box method. However, it is not. Instead, individuals inspired by kids who call themselves the Kia Boys from Milwaukee are using old school methods to steal Kias and Hondas manufactured between 2011 and 2021 with nothing more than a USB cord. And it works. The Kia Boys were made famous by Tommy G, who also lives in Milwaukee which is where he did all of his interviews detailing the antics and methods of the Kia boys, wherein they were able to steal a car in 20 to 30 seconds. The info was originally on TikTok. Now it was ultimately removed, but not until 3.3 million people viewed it. It was also on YouTube where the Kia Boys documentary was posted where another 3.7 million people watched. And since this info has gotten out there, there have been a rash of cars being stolen across the nation. Most of these Kias and Hondas are simply being taken for joy rides by kids and are left damaged or destroyed but some of them are just gone. These videos revealed exactly how they are going about it, and it's simple old school hot wiring. And you say, hmm, I didn't think you could do that anymore. Well, you couldn't until Kia and Hyundai decided to cut costs, and they manufactured tens of thousands of these cars using simple metal keys with no chip, no transponders, so no immobilizer system. So all you have to do is break the window, get in the car, remove the steering column cover, and you can just tear it off in these cars. It takes about 10 seconds. From there, you follow the wire assembly up to the ignition switch. And while some ignition systems are essentially one integrated piece, in these Kias and Hondas, it's a bunch of component parts that snap together, kind of like Legos. So all you have to do is move the wire assembly connector piece to the side and locate a little pin at the base of the lock tumbler that you simply push in with a screwdriver or a pick and the lock mechanism just pulls out. This exposes the ignition switch, which is a little nub that a USB connector fits perfectly on. 
creating a little lever that you can turn to start the vehicle. And it's that simple. And it's these Korean cars with old school metal keys that have car thieves stealing them by the bunches. These thieves specifically target vehicles with the physical metal key slot as the push start models can't be hotwired near as easily. So how bad is it? Well, Florida reports that more than a third of all car thefts since mid-July are linked to the TikTok challenge. Los Angeles officials say they have seen an 85% increase in thefts of Hondas and Kias. In Chicago, car thefts are up over 800% with Korean cars. And in Milwaukee, where this all started, Korean car thefts are up 2,500%. Wow. It was so bad in the city of St. Louis that the government was giving out the club those steering wheel lock devices to people for free to deter thefts. And for what it's worth, the club works, not because it's impenetrable, but because most thieves, when they see them, will just move on to an easier mark. So if you have one of these cars, get a club. And if you have already had your car stolen and didn't have insurance, Ken McLean, an attorney in Missouri has filed suit in 12 different states against Kia, calling the issue a product defect. So look him up if you are in need of a lawyer. So that's the episode. I hope you enjoyed taking a look back at the history of hot wiring and looking at the Kia boys. Again, the information in this video on how cars are stolen is provided so that you can protect yourself from car thieves. It is not meant to be a tutorial to you on how to steal cars. So everybody behave out there in Lawyer Up Nation. Remember, if you enjoyed the video, to hit that like button. If you got a question or a comment, put it in the comment section below. And if you haven't subscribed, subscribe right now. I appreciate you guys watching. My name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up.